Hey guys, welcome back. It's Caitlin, your favorite service dog trainer. And I came across this story in my inbox this morning. I love it. <laughs> uh, one, because it's accurate. And two, because it tells a really great story and a lot of people go through this. Um, I can't, I mean, I see it all the time. I see this all the time. Um, so to actually see this represented in a news story accurately, um, kind of blows me away because all the other stories we go over usually are not accurate. They are interchanging a service dog with emotional support animal and therapy dog. And it's just a hot mess. So let's take some time. Let's enjoy this together um, and watch their story. Okay, Lynn, you ready? Come on, let's start. It's training time for Beth Pratt and her dog, Windigo. That's, that's, that's a good girl. But this dog isn't learning to sit and roll over. One more, Lynn. That's it. Yes, good girl. My name is Beth Pratt, and this is my service dog, Windigo. She's four years old, and I got her when she was eight weeks old. So I never intended for her to be a service dog. She was just going to be another one of my pets. Okay. I'm going to stop you guys right here. <laughs> I get this story all the time. All the time when people are coming up there, they're calling me on the phone or they sent me an email or maybe they applied online to the program. And this is the exact, like, I swear, the exact situation that most people find themselves in. They never expected to start training one needing a service dog. Um, or they've been rejected from, from so many organizations that they need to go ahead and pursue their own needs and take things into accountability into their own hands. And I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, it's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's accurate. It's accurate. Um, anyways, I'll shut up so you can go watch Beth and Wendigo's story. But plans changed, as they so often do, because of health. Well, I have a disability, so it's a neurological disability. I have trouble with um, strength in my hands, and I have trouble with stability, so balance, balance issues. And it's progressive, so it continually gets worse. So Pratt decided to get a service animal, in her case, a mobility dog. And I want to say, too, um, I mean, she, Beth is crunched for time, right? like a lot of people, if you find yourself needing something to help you live your everyday life, um, and especially if it's a progressive de degenerative disease, um, like you don't, you can't mess around. You have to take that power into your own hands um, so that you can get the help you need, not be on a five year long waiting list to hopefully maybe get a dog in the next two years after that. Like. <laughs> It would help her balance when walking, pick up her dropped cell phone, purse, or pill bottle. It could help preserve her independence. Yes, good girl. All that being said, though, I do want to add in my two cents um, from my experience as a trainer because um, later on in this article, they'll be saying stuff about temperament of a dog, which is a whole, I don't know, I don't know what word they can say, a, a whole clusterfuck in and of, its, of itself. Um, but people do the best with what they have. And sometimes they can't always get a dog that's like perfectly temperament tested, um, or, or in the perfect, most easy type of dog personality you can have as a service dog and people work with what they have. Um, and you'll see that later on in here too. Anyways, I'm just, I'm just all excited. I'm sorry. Several organizations in Canada provide service animals for people with disabilities or mental health issues, but when Pratt applied, her plan was brought to heel. I sent in the form, um, but then I got a letter back saying that they weren't taking applications and that the waiting list was five years. So now they have such a backlog that they won't take applications, so who knows how long that's going to be for. Please? Like so many things, that backlog is largely due to the pandemic. But there's also an increased demand for service dogs as the list of service. Yeah, and that's something I've heard too. 
Um, I've heard other organizations are, or they, they face struggles during the pandemic with socializing their puppies. Um, I'm not sure how that's played out with most organizations. Um, you know, it certainly doesn't stop dogs from breeding, but I wonder, I wonder if it's affected the quality of the dogs that they've been able to get out or applications for puppy raisers. I don't know. That would be um, really interesting to delve more into. Um, I haven't, I don't know. Says they can provide keeps getting longer. The dogs can do so many things. There's seizure alert dogs. There's dogs for um, people with diabetes that can sometimes detect blood sugar lows. They do autism dogs, which are very popular. Hearing loss, mental health issues. I mean, there's just so many opportunities uh, that people can gain from having a service dog. If you can afford it, you can skip the waiting lists and buy a trained service dog. When Pratt priced them, she was quoted between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. Hold it. But there's another way. Well, there's a thing called owner trained service dogs. So it's perfectly legal and you can train your own dog to be your service dog. Now I don't know too much about Canadian laws. Um, this is from a Canadian news website. So I'm assuming this story is from Canada. <laughs> I don't know if we have any Canadians in the house, um, but I definitely appreciate comments down below because I'm always interested in learning more about service dog laws throughout throughout um, the world. Um, so yeah. Touch. There's no licensing body, no certification required. All you need is a note from your doctor. The vest you can buy on Amazon. But to get a service dog to do the services takes a ton of training and the right temperament for the dog and the owner. And then you look online and you look in books and you see what a I have to say, hold on. So I, I do both board and train puppies and helping owner trainers with their service dogs, right? These are two different categories. Like they are so polar opposite and so different from each other. And let me tell you why because I currently have a board and train uh, puppy here with me right now. And he was, I don't wanna say temperament tested because it's not quite a temperament test. It's better than a test, temperament test. It's a carrot test, C-A-R-A-T, okay? So it's a Suzanne Clothier's carrot test. Um, basically, it's very, very informative for putting a dog into a job not just service dog, but for like bomb detection or police work or therapy work or just as a pet home or even picking a dog from a shelter. Like it's that comprehensive. So um, the difference between puppy raising a dog and that's that's my standard, right? If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna puppy raise a dog, I wanna give the people the best chance possible and have the best experience possible so that I pick the right dog for the right job, for the right home, for the right disability. Um, there's a lot of considerations that go into this. So that's one of the big differences between that and me helping somebody that just comes up to me and say, hey, I've been training my dog for a year or two. We're struggling with X, Y, Z. Um, and the dog might be struggling with these issues because they're not that perfect carrot profile, right? Um, but they can't afford another dog or they just need help inside the house or they really just need to take their time and go past the normal two years for training um, to work on these little issues that mean a lot. So um, it's, it's, total, it's two totally different worlds. Um, if you get the dog with the right temperament, it's it, in many cases, it's easy breezy, beautiful cover girl to train these dogs. At least it is for me as a professional. Um, because again, like I'm training a dog for board and train versus I'm training the owner to train this dog who might have some more difficult problems to work through as a team. So there's a lot of different factors. Um, and it's just two polar opposite worlds. It's two polar opposite worlds. Other people do, and I'm joining a couple of Facebook groups with people who have service dogs, and you can ask questions and see what other people have done, what has worked for them, and you just work every single day at it. Hi, guys. 
Hi, Natasha. How are you? Good. How Good. Are you? It's nice to see you again. Good to see you too. Yeah. There are so many people in Pratt's position that a new business has sprung up to service them. Natasha Pinson is a longtime dog trainer who now trains people. My business is about helping people train their own dogs to be served. This is the pause here. I love, I love how she prepared for the TV interview with the paw earrings. That's all. First dogs. Back in the day, they were training for specific things like blindness, uh, even for veterans for PTSD. But now more and more, there's so many people suffering that the waiting lists are so long uh, just to get somebody to train your dog for you and then give it to you that so many people feel. Uh, I also really like her business name, Signal Service Dogs. That's fantastic. Lost and without hope because it could be years before they even get on a list to talk to somebody about what they need. Pratt and Windigo are taking classes with Pinson, but Pinson says most people who call her don't actually need a service dog. They need a therapy dog or emotional support animal. Which is true. Uh, I've had a handful of people call me needing a ser saying they need a service dog or they want to get this with the new DOT restrictions that we all know in the U.S. has happened, um, where you know. Small animals have to be in a carrier unless a service dog and there's now you have to pay to have your animal on a flight. Some people are looking to bypass paying that. And one of the big things that I tell them is, well, what it looks like you're trying what you need is an emotional support animal or what you have is an emotional support animal and or a therapy dog. Um, and if you're trying to bypass that fee, which I already know they are, I don't have to ask them. <laughs> I say, oh, I tell them how long it takes and how much it costs. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm like, yeah, so that's not what you're getting. <laughs> it's not what you're getting. Um, so that does occasionally happen and I have to like bring them down to reality and be like, yeah, that's not what we do here. I don't just give you a paper and you can go fly for free with your dog and I don't know how they would act, so. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Which the difference is therapy dogs are kind of like if I'm stressed, I'll touch the dog and the dog will bring me comfort or I bring it to a place and it brings other people comfort. A service dog has to perform a task specific to the person. Uh, so that's what makes a service dog different. For people who rely on service animals, they're a lifeline that keeps other important parts of life within reach. Uh, we're at the YMCA and we are about to go to a cycle fit swim class. I mean, she helps me keep my balance until I get to the spin class. She also helps me when I'm in the change room because I can uh, brace myself against her when I'm standing up or when I'm taking off my coat. But she's really good. She usually stays in place, rests and relaxes and watches what's going on. When people see Pratt with Windigo at the gym or the mall, she hopes they respect her privacy and their space. But she's also happy to answer questions and help normalize service animals in public. I find that I know people a little bit better because people come and they ask me about her and we get to talking and then everyone seems to know my name and who I am. I love this because it's so true. Um, that in and of itself for some people can be a huge benefit it can also be a huge drawback but it's really amazing to see my clients practice a skill hone in on that skill and they get these i mean they get compliments from just strangers passing them on the street and that builds them up and it makes them feel like they know what they're doing it builds it gives, again it gives them that confidence um, it makes them proud. They have something to be proud about too, that they have worked this hard to, you know, have this animal for them. Um, and just to see the transformation and the change in the way they hold themselves and the way that they speak. Um, I mean, it's, I live for it. It's so cool. It's so cool. Cause my dog. <laughs> She also wants to help normalize the do-it-yourself path that she and Windigo have taken. It's not for everyone or every dog, but Pratt says it can lead 
to a better life. If you feel like you want to put the time and effort into it, and you feel you have the capability, you know, and you have the right dog, then go for it. That being said, this is a great note to end on because some people need a board and train or need to purchase a dog. Um, I think that's fairly obvious, right? That's, that's pretty obvious. Um, Cause I have had, I can spot it pretty early on now where somebody may, you know, think they like, like they do need a service dog, but like there's just, there's behaviors that are kind of red flags. It's like, yeah, that's not gonna fit in your lifestyle or you're not gonna be able to maintain the training, right? So it's really good as an owner trainer to have that self-reflection like, okay, have we been progressing? Yes. Are we actually staying consistent training every day, every other day, a few times a week? Are we, you know, going in that direction? So, um, you know, having that ability to self-reflect, you know, some people don't have that, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, at the same time, you know, that's when you have to start thinking about, okay, what are the alternatives? Like, can we do fundraising? Can we find money somewhere? Do we have a friend? Do we have somebody, right? Can we get on the news and have an anonymous donor? Um, that happens. Guys, that happens. If you can get your word out in order to fundraise, you can get that money fairly quickly um, if you have the right channels to help you get the help that you need, right? It does, it does take a community to raise a service dog. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of my two cents on that topic. But I think that, that's a really good way to wrap it up. That's a really good way to wrap it up. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. And I look at the bacon pieces. <laughs> Those are big bacon pieces, man. Love it. I love it. Good job, Beth. I love her. I love her and Wendigo. Ah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that story as much as I did. Um, oh, how do I get out of here? Oh, 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 there we go. Anyways. I hope you guys enjoyed that story as much as I did. Um, I haven't been super, super frequent on social media these days. I've been working on my own mental health and my own sanity. <laughs> so I, w I felt inspired this morning and just wanted to hop on. But if you do want to follow me and my very inconsistent posting or stalk the previous post that I've already put on the internet, which I believe is good content. Um, you can follow me on my socials at Caitlin's Animals on Instagram, on TikTok, uh, and even on YouTube. And if you're here on Facebook, um, you can also pop my page a follow at Caitlin's Animal Training. So guys, thank you so much for your time today, and I'll see you later. Bye.